chapter 12 uh, this morning. I know some of you are like, what? That's a big chapter, a lot of depth in that chapter, but we're going to camp there this morning. We are uh, taking a little bit of a break for the next two weeks from our Meet Jesus series where we've been harmonizing the Gospels. If you are new today, that's what we've been doing. Um, I'm going to jump out of that for the next two weeks. And uh, the reason is... Um, I was chatting to a friend uh, a week before last uh, when I got back from a little bit of leave and uh, I was saying, hey man, what do you think the church needs to hear? Not that we're going to uh, necessarily topical preach today, but he said, what do you think the church needs to hear? And because of his passion for believers serving the local body, he's like, why don't you just hit them with some messages about how Christians should serve? And I said, great idea. So he threw at me Romans 12, 4 to 8 and he threw at me 1 Corinthians 12 as well. Um, but I thought while I was preparing um, this week, I was reading Romans 12, 4 to 7, and I read up for a little bit of context from verse 1. And I just thought to myself, there's way too much in this verse to leave it there. So I'm going to preach this text um, over the next two weeks, um, verses 1 through to 8. When I was reading uh, Romans 12, and like I said, I read up for context. Um, I noticed this, and I've actually titled my sermon along the lines of what I notice is that with regards to verses 1 to 8, there's this truth that jumped out to me. And it's this, is that we need to first serve Him, i.e. God. We need to serve Him personally before we can serve Him publicly. And I want to just premise the whole sermon with that this morning. That we first and foremost, if we want to serve God publicly, as we're going to learn about next week, with the right understanding of who we are, who others are, and our gifts, we first and foremost need to be serving Him personally. All right? So over the next two weeks, I want to chat a little bit about serving as believers, okay? But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to get up here and then try to convict you or convince you into serving and then after the service have a whole lot of clipboards as to where you can sign up and serve. That's not the heart of what I'm doing here. Rather, what I do want to do is this. I want to unpack Romans 12, 1 to 8, and I want to look at two big things that have jumped out to me um, when I've been studying this text. So this week, I want to have a look at your service through commitment to God needs to first and foremost be a personal inward journey, okay? That's today. Next week, we're going to have a look at how then that personal journey and that personal service becomes public, needs to become public. And if I could sum up um, what I would like to achieve in the next two weeks, it would be this. I've got a little tag phrase here. To serve God holistically is based on us first serving him in our personal capacity through commitment to him, verses one and two. Then serving him in a public capacity by having a godly perspective about ourselves, about others, and about our gifts that he has given to us, verses, four to, verses three to eight. So effective service of God and his kingdom is preceded by a sincere commitment to God and his kingdom. So let's read Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 through to 8. I'm going to read the whole bit that we're going to be studying for the next two weeks, but we're going to be camping at verses 1 and 2 this week. Paul begins by saying this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, brothers, and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He goes on, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Before I go any further, I want to encourage you that if you do have a Bible, please open it. Um, if you don't have a Bible and you have a cell phone, you can open your Bible app. If you don't have a Bible app, you can download a Bible app because it's going to be very important to follow in this text. I'm going to very simply walk through it today. Okay, so the book of Romans, written by Paul, writes the church at Rome where he had planned to visit. And um, there were both Jews and Gentiles, okay, there at that time. 
And Paul wrote with two very big specific things in mind, okay? He wrote to the Christians what they are to believe, all right? The fundamentals of what they are to believe. And then secondly, he wrote about how they are to behave, okay? That's where, from chapter 12, that's where it takes us, how believers are to be conducting themselves and behaving, okay? So this text today, very well-known text, all right? And as I was reading it, um, these first two verses of scripture today, they just scream this idea and this truth of a believer's commitment to God, okay? A believer's commitment to God. And from verses one and two, I have two observations, so I've failed you as a Baptist this morning. I don't have three, I only have two, okay? Two observations from this text this morning, okay? And the first one is this, from verse one, simply, lay it all down. The first point that I'd like to make today is lay it all down. And this is where I got this. So Paul begins, have a look there. He says, I beseech you, all right? Which ultimately means to urge someone on to something, to, to encourage them, to implore them, which in a nutshell means to beg somebody to do something. That is what the word he is using here is conveying. That's the message it is conveying. And when I read that, it tells me that there's weight behind what Paul is about to say. So it's kind of a, hey, church, here is back then, here is today, listen up. Because what I'm about to say, not me, but Paul, through God, what he's about to say, it's gonna carry some weight, all right? Charles Cranfield, he gives this beautiful summary of what Paul um, was trying to allude to here when he said this, and he expands his summary like this. He says, it's this earnest appeal based on the gospel, so what they've been taught to believe so far, to those who already are believers, to live consistently with the gospel that they have received. That is what Paul is going to get across now. So Paul's saying, here is, please, he's begging them, imploring them, based on the gospel that you know. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. And then he comes along and he says, therefore, I beseech you, therefore, and I can imagine the hearers taking a step back and being, what now, Paul? You know, this is going to get hectic. What now? And the reason is, whenever we see this word, therefore, the number one rule we have to always keep in mind, okay, is we always have to ask this question of what is therefore, therefore, all right? So whenever you see the word therefore in your Bible, always ask yourself the question, what is therefore, therefore? It's going to help you with context. So I want to ask that question today. What is Paul saying here? What is therefore, therefore? Paul is pointing them to the fact that based on their knowledge, and the theological depth of what Jesus has done, there now needs to be a practical outworking of that understanding in their lives. That is what he's about to get at here, okay? So what then, according to Paul, is the foundational truth of our commitment and our service to Jesus? What drives everything that Paul is about to say? And he answers it. He says, the mercies of God. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, which is demonstrated by this withholding of a deserved consequence that someone deserves. That is what mercy is. A withholding of a deserved consequence that someone deserves that is fueled by compassion and forgiveness of the wrongs that someone has done. That is what Paul is alluding to here. So by him using these words, by the mercies of God, he's pointing the hearers and us today back to chapters one to 11. He's pointing us back there where the mercies of God are laid out. They're explained, they're expounded, and they're just made clear for the hearers and the readers to see. And ultimately, verse, chapters 1 to 11 lay out the gospel of Jesus Christ so clearly. And I can sum them up like this. The first thing is, he speaks about justification from the guilt and the penalty of sin. He speaks about adoption in Jesus and identification with Christ. He speaks about how we are placed under grace, not the law giving the Holy Spirit to live within us. He speaks about the promise of help in affliction. He speaks about assurance of standing in God's election. He speaks about confidence of the coming glory. He speaks of confidence in the fact that there's no separation from the love of God. And lastly, he speaks about the fact that we have confidence in God's continued faithfulness. That was laid out in chapters one to 11. So, Based on the mercies of God, as we've just seen, laid out, summarized in chapters 1 to 11, 
so beautifully. The believer now, I believe, has an obligatory response to that, okay? An obligatory response, and this is what it is. Paul says it, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. To present yourselves as a living sacrifice to God based on what Jesus has done for you, believer. So let's break that down. He says to present. Now in the Greek, it's, it's, it's referring to this ritual presentation of a, of a sacrifice, okay? And there's something very beautiful in this. Because based on what Jesus has done for you, it's beautiful because we can come to Jesus and we can say, Jesus, here I am, presenting myself to you sacrificially at and for your disposal. And it's figuratively placing ourselves on the altar of God saying, here I am, I'm available, presenting oneself. He goes on to say, present your bodies. Now I love this because he's speaking of the totality of who you are everything, the entirety of who you are as a human being sitting here today. And I don't believe for a second that God just wants good and honorable works from us. That's not what he's after completely, okay? He's not just wanting good and honorable works from us, but he wants the entirety of who you are. Your whole body, meaning your soul, your will, your mind, everything that you are presented to him as a living sacrifice. That is what he wants from us. So Paul goes on after he says, present your bodies, he says, present them as a living sacrifice. And now the hearers at this time would have been met with a very vivid picture, an idea, because they would have, through knowledge, they would have had this understanding of sacrifices among the Jews and the pagans. They would have understood what was being said here. And in the Old Testament, there there was this idea that the sacrifice was brought to the altar of God and fully consumed, okay? Okay. However, believers are now called to voluntarily make a decisive dedication of themselves as worshippers of God by stepping forward, by placing themselves before God as an offering. Like I said just now, saying, God, here I am. Listen to this quote by F.F. Bruce. He says, the sacrifices of the new order do not consist in the taking of the lives of others like the ancient animal sacrifices, but in giving one's own. Jesus pioneered this, right? Think about that. Jesus pioneered this. And don't you find it amazing that we have Jesus as a model of what it means to offer oneself as a living sacrifice? I think that's beautiful. So once again, Paul is saying, because of the mercies of God, through Jesus, the person, the work of Jesus, he's saying the only fitting response would be a committed and unreserved life of sacrificial worship to him. That is what Paul is trying to get across here. And what I love about the Bible, whenever we're given some sort of exhortation, encouragement, command, advice, guidance, it doesn't just leave us hanging as to like, is it good for me, is it not good for me, why should I do it, why shouldn't I do it? And Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't just leave us hanging, guessing, okay, what ourselves have sacrificed as sacrifices at and for the disposal of God should look like. He gives us two things. He says that our sacrifice to God needs to be holy and it needs to be acceptable. And he's kind of painting a picture of the characteristic of our sacrifice. He's saying this is what it should look like, holy and acceptable. And by him saying holy, He says that this is as a result of you saying no to sin, number one, and then saying yes to God, and then being set apart for him as a result of him calling you as an an individual believer, okay? It's a decision, it's a striving, it's a constant pursuit of holiness that Paul is calling us to do. And he speaks about this word acceptable, okay? And it's not because we are acceptable in and of ourselves, or we don't deserve to be accepted necessarily because of sin, right? There was a divide between us and God because of sin, but because the offering that we present are sincere and they are true to God's requirement, making them acceptable. And when I looked at this word sacrifice, I couldn't help but jump my mind to the Old Testament and thought about books like Leviticus and like Deuteronomy. In Leviticus 1.10, hear this, It says, if his offering is of the flocks of the sheep or of the goats as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring bring a male, hear this, without blemish. 
without blemish. And then in Deuteronomy 15, 21, it says this, but if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Now these scriptures challenged me and they made me think about the standard of our sacrifice that we ought to offer to God. The standard of our sacrifice. In the Old Testament, no blemish, no defect was the requirement. The best of the best was the benchmark that God required of his people. So the standard for sacrifice under the new covenants of grace are no less than those of the old covenant with God's people. Jesus himself was the spotless land of, lamb of God, our example that we can follow after. Yes, we are riddled with flaws, myself included, standing up here today. I'm a human being, I'm sinful. We are riddled with flaws. We can still, however, effectively strive for holiness. That is what Paul is calling us to do. Through the help of Jesus, resulting in us being acceptable. I want to address a misconception real quick. I just said to you all publicly that we are all riddled with flaws, myself included. There's been, when I was reading some commentators, they, they brought this point up that throughout history, there's been this misconception that pastors, priests and other denominations, missionaries, those who are called to full-time ministry are called to a higher degree of, of commitment and holiness um, than the rest of the church. So that's like saying Brad must be more holy than you sitting here today, okay? But the truth is believers who could be teachers, accountants, sports coaches, managers, business owners, engineers, whatever field you find yourself in, are all equally called to strive, the point I want to make, is for 100% commitment to holiness as a means of service to God. Because as soon as we begin to think as the past has allowed, we put people in different categories. Incorrectly elevating some people above others, which unfortunately will and does result in idolatry. And Paul lands this verse which I think is very beautiful when he says, which is your reasonable service? Which is your reasonable service? And the idea that Paul is getting across here is this, in the context. He's saying, believer, once again, based on your understanding, the theological understanding that I've given you of what has been done for you in and through Jesus, what I, Paul, have urged you to do is the most logical and fitting response that we can think of in light of that, in light of the fact that Jesus died for you, the least we can do is offer ourselves as a living sacrifice for him. So what is being suggested to us here is a full, unreserved commitment to Jesus. Sam Shoemaker says this, and I love it. He says, to be a Christian means to give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus as I know. And this is something we can grow in and we can strive to grow in. That as we live life, we give as much as we can to as much as Jesus as we know. So I'd like to challenge your heart this morning because there's no point in opening the word if it doesn't challenge our hearts. I'm gonna ask you three questions real quick. I want you to listen carefully. From what you know about Jesus and his work accomplished for you, him being fully man, fully God, his death, his substitutionary death in your place, his burial and his resurrection, from what you know about Jesus and his work accomplished for you, is there a deep-seated desire to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holistically committed to him as your means of service to his kingdom? The second one is this. Does God's mercy, everything, the gospel in its entirety, his grace, does God's mercy urge you on towards personal sacrifice? And then lastly, are you prepared to lay it all down? As Paul is asking here, present yourself as a living sacrifice for God, completely at his disposal. Now verse one has taught us about a holistic commitment to God. Now verse two informs us of two activities, so please glance your eyes there, two activities, one positive, one negative, right? command that will assist us it's going to help us now because what he said is quite a it's quite a big task present yourselves holy and acceptable as a living sacrifice your bodies the entirety of who you are it's quite a big ask 
But like I said, he doesn't leave us hanging. Now in verse two, he gives us these two tasks that will assist us in carrying out the task of being a living sacrifice to the Lord. The second observation I made was this. We are never the same again. We are never the same again. If we fulfill the task that verse one has required of us, we are never the same again. So have a look there at verse two. Paul continues. And do not be conformed, he says. Paul is cautioning his hearers to not allow the world to receive their full commitment in place of God and to not allow the world to be their model for living. Now, when I was preparing this, I was just thinking, um, I've I've recently embarked on a little bit of a study on the book of Revelation because a whole lot of people in the church have started doing it. There's like this Revelation fad right now, you know, which is cool. So I thought, let me also study it. So I got myself a commentary. I've been reading through it. And uh, in the opening chapters of the commentary that I read, the, the commentator makes this point that so much so much of the world is blinded to the person, work, and the truth of who Jesus is. And he, he attributes this blindness to the fact that he, he has this little tag phrase, it's a fundamental religion of materialism. And the point he's making is that people are focusing on only what they can see, what they can hear, feel, touch, achieve in life, what they can work for and then get reward for. So they don't even think further than that, hey, what happens in eternity? What happens? Who is Jesus? They are blinded to the spiritual reality of who Jesus is, okay? And the Bible gives us reason why conforming to the world's mold should be avoided. That's what the world wants us, to be blinded to the truth of who Jesus is. And it ultimately, this is what I want to say, this is why it cautions us, is because it, it ultimately it hinders our witness as believers. It hinders our witness as believers. Robert Mounts, he says this, its values and its goals are antithetical, meaning they are completely contrasted to, they are opposite to growth in holiness. The church, God's people, should stand out from the world as a demonstration of God's intention for the human race. This is a challenge. To be culturally identified with the world is to place the church at risk. Whew, how was that one, eh? That's a challenge. To be culturally identified with the world is to place the church at risk. Now, I have to say this. This is not a call to exclusivity. I'm better than you because I'm a Christian and you're a sinner. That's not what this is calling us to. It's not calling us to have an attitude of self-righteousness either. But what it is, it's calling us to a Matthew 5, 13 to 14 kind of call. You are the salt of the earth. You are, but if the salt loses its flavor, how should it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, it says. A city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. There is an influence to be had, church, and that only comes through being countercultural. That is what we're being called to here, not conforming. Now, that's the negative command that he gives us, but the positive now, he says, the, the positive fruitful replacements of not conforming, he says, rather, be transformed. Be transformed. That is what Paul is calling us to hear. And the idea that is being conveyed here is the idea of metamorphosis. For those who did biology in school who know biology, um, metamorphosis, a change from one form to another. Okay? And the best thing that I could think of when I thought about metamorphosis was the way in which a caterpillar that changes to a butterfly Yes, that's correct. A caterpillar that changed, I have to think about that. A caterpillar, <laughs> I was like, oh, am, I, am I preaching heresy here in biological forms? Um, a caterpillar that changes to a butterfly will never, ever be a caterpillar again. A tadpole that morphs into a frog will never go back to being a tadpole again, unless there's some sort of natural phenomenon, but it won't happen, okay? They will never be the same again. And then I want to relate that to this. Someone who has been transformed through the work of Jesus will never be the same again. Hence my point for verse two. You will never be the same again as that transforming work of Jesus takes place in your heart and life. And the same idea is used here in, in Matthew 17, two and Mark 9, two, where Jesus was transfigured, transformed before his disciples. I love this. The glory of who God was, all right, was shown physically, through Jesus. It's beautiful. And may I make this point, that you're either conforming or transforming, one of the two. And whether you are conforming or transforming will both be evidently seen in our lives. 
Which is the ultimate characteristic in your life? Conforming to the world or being transformed by the Spirit? It's a question I'd like to pose to you. So as believers in Jesus, we get to experience what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, which is a privilege. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How does this transformation take place? I'm glad you asked. All right? Paul tells us, he has the answer, by the renewal of your mind. Okay? The renewal of your mind. So listen up here. All right? Listen carefully. This renewal, right, it is and it has to be the work of someone or something. We can't do it alone. It has to be the work of something and someone. As we submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus through faith in his person and his work, two things, person and work, and the Holy Spirit as a result of that dwells deep within our hearts, the Holy Spirit begins to bring about renewal in our hearts and minds. And I'd like to think that this is both an instantaneous as well as an ongoing renewal that takes place in our hearts and our minds. This is a process whereby the Holy Spirit changes and it renews us more and more into the likeness of Jesus as we begin to commit to him and devote ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. So you are not to be conformed to the ways of the world, but by the renewal of your mind through the Holy Spirit's work, you are to be transformed more and more into the likeness and character of Jesus based on the work he's accomplished for us. And this is not a sit back, relax, Jesus, you do the work kind of thing. I believe we do have a role to play in the transformation process, sanctification, if we can call it that. Okay, we have a role to play in this process. And it's as, it's as simple, but more than giving an active no to the world and a yes to Jesus and allowing God's spirit to transform us. So it's the Holy Spirit who transforms us into the image of Christ. And we'll never be the same again. The beautiful thing about this is that there's a big culminating effect in results and that ultimately is one day we'll be glorified with Jesus in heaven forever for those who love him. So someone who has embarked on this transformation process will never be the same again. A frog can't go back to a tadpole. Neither can a butterfly go back to being a caterpillar. They transformed. And then he lands, Paul. He says that you may prove what is the good an acceptable and perfect will of God. So as a direct result of you, believer, presenting yourself as a living sacrifice to God, then abstaining from following and allowing the world to conform us to its image. Remember when I say that, I just want to say this again. When I say not allowing the world to conform us to an image, it's not a call to exclusivity and self-righteousness. You must hear that, okay? but instead being transformed, having your mind renewed through the Spirit's indwelling as our means of service to God, it is then, completely at God's disposal, it is then that we begin to discover God's will for our life. As we begin to commit to God, His will is revealed to us. So often, we get these questions in the ministry like, how do I know God's will for my life? You know, etc. And the number one thing is just to press into everything that He is. Follow God with all you have. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Your desires become his desires the more we delight ourselves in him. So to land, a commitment to Jesus places us in a position to have his will revealed to us. And next week, church, um, because you've been here for week number one, you have to be here for week number two. um, So you're kind of locked in now. But next week, you get to see God's will for us in serving him and having a godly mindset regarding others ourselves and the use of our gifts in the local church and for the benefit of his kingdom. Let's pray. As a prayer, I just want to, again, challenge everyone with two questions. So to the believer first this morning, as we pray, is your commitment to God being seen through a life marked by being a living sacrifice to the Lord that is being continually transformed into the likeness of Jesus? To the unbeliever sitting here this morning, have you responded in faith to the mercies of God, the fact that he is fully man, fully God. He died a death that we deserved, a substitutionary death, an atonement that appeased the wrath of God on our behalf. He died, he rose again, he's ascended to the right hand of God. 
that through faith in his person and his work and repentance from sin, we can be saved. Unbeliever, have you responded like that? Jesus, I thank you that you give us scriptures such as these that challenge our hearts that when we, when we come before you, Lord, we are called to lay it all down, be living sacrifices for you. And Lord, I thank you that through the transforming power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus, we are never the same again. So Lord, help us throughout this next week to hold on to these verses. Don't allow us to become comfortable. Don't allow us to become spiritually overweight. Allow us to take the good news of Jesus to as many people as we can. Keep us close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome, church. Thanks for coming today. And... We'll see you all next week. I've seen everyone's faces, so you have to be here next week. Part two.